Yeah, good morning. All right. And the power is still on. Oh, I know, I know last week was an inconvenience, and I, again, I apologize for that. But, you know, I've been, I've been thinking and praying this week. Maybe it, was, maybe it was part of God's plan for us to have another week just to prepare ourselves to get ready. I got a cable right here. And get, to get ready, to get ready for what he has in store for us. I mean, I think we'd all agree that God's been very faithful here in the past year to us as a church. Uh, so to a lot of people, you know, he's been faithful to you individually. God has done some things, and I think he's, I think he's got something. So he's planted something really big for this year that can only be explained. The only way it can be explained is he's working through us to do something, to help us, to help us as a church and to help us as individuals to be who he has called us to be, to actually be those people he's called to be, to, to live a life, to, to live a godly life as we go each day, how to live that godly life. Even in the scriptures, Second Peter tells us, he says that you ought to live holy and godly lives. You ought to do this. And maybe we needed that week off just to get us ready because, you know, the year started and everything is going and it's cold and we got power one day, we got water one day, we don't have water one day, we come in on Sunday morning. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. And Duke Power can't explain it. I talked to him on the phone. There was nothing, nothing in their system that said anything happened here last Sunday. Are you serious? No, I don't see anything. They said, what about this Sunday? Do I need to go ahead and call it off? No. There's nothing scheduled for this Sunday either. But so, you know, and I'm, I'm on the phone and I'm like, all right, Peter, I got to live a godly life here. How do I, how do, I do that? What, what's that supposed to look like in, in my life, in, in your life, to live a godly life? It, it, this last week I was, I was reading an article about a new art gallery and being an art major in college. And Karen will tell you this. I'm fascinated when I walk into an art gallery. I'm like a kid in a toy store. Well, I can't wait to get in when everybody's really being proper. And well, I want them out of my way. I want to get in. There are, certain, there are certain periods of art that I am emotionally drawn to. And Karen will tell you this. And if it's in that gallery, I'll find it. I'll find that period of artists and those paintings and things and those sculptures. And I, I can stand there for hours in front of one painting and just look at it. And just be drawn into it and, you know, be attached to it. And, you know, maybe you've been that way. You, you, and there, there's still some. There's still some paintings I look at and say, what in the world? But anyway, I was reading this article about this new gallery. And the people were walking around in the gallery. They're introducing all the artists and, and all the paintings and things. And there was, this, there was this older lady that was going through the gallery. And she saw this painting and she was standing there just... You know how you do in a gallery, you sort of, sort of get, you get far away from it. So you really, and she's just staring, and, and she hears this artist talking about his painting. She's you know, listening to him describe his painting, and she walked over to him and said, what is this supposed to be? Yeah, have you ever done that? <laughs> and I was reading an article that the artist turned to her and spoke to her in a condescending tone. I'm an art major. I've hung out in galleries. I've hung around eccentric artists. I know that condescending tone. I know when they're making fun of me and when they're, they're really insulted by because they're eccentric people. And artists are crazy anyway. And uh, I can say that because I'm an artist. And so the article said that he turned to her and said, my dear, that's supposed to be a mother and her child. And she responded, well, why isn't it? <laughs> You know, you can, can you relate? I mean, why isn't it? I don't see no art. Where? I mean, it's, it doesn't look anything. And I'm wondering sometimes, does that ever happen in my life? When I live my life? I mean, I, I say I'm a Christian. I say I'm a child of God. I decided to uh, follow Jesus and to be obedient and try to serve him with everything I had and live a godly life, just like Peter says, that you ought to live holy and godly lives but does anyone ever look at my life and, and, and say to someone, well, I know what he says he's supposed to be, so why isn't he? Why isn't he? I mean, can people tell that we are followers of Jesus by the way we live our life? Or do they have to come into our world? I mean, do, do we go out and share 
God's love publicly. Do we share God's love publicly when we're in school? Do we share God's love publicly when we're at work? Do we share God's love publicly with our family and friends? Or do they have to come into our world? Do they have to be a part of our comfort zone to see Jesus? Are we being the church if people have to come here to see Jesus and hear about Jesus? Are we being the church? This whole series is we are the church. What's it going to take for us to be the church? Because we are the church. It's not the building, it's us. I was reading in the Old Testament and Deuteronomy. It, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. But and toward the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is about to die. He's, he's got the Israelite nation through the wilderness to the edge of the promised land. But he's not going to carry them into the promised land. That's not God's plan for him. He can see it, but he can't go there. And he's about to die. And before he dies, he writes a song because Moses is an artist. He writes a song so the Israelite nation would memorize this song and re rely on this song and sing this song to remind them of God's faithfulness in their past. How God was with them in Egypt. How God helped them through their time of slavery. How God brought the plagues, how God took them through the Red Sea, how God provided them for them through the wilderness, God's faithfulness. This would be a song that they would sing and remind them of how God has been providing for them, how God has been preparing them, how God has been training them to live godly lives over in the promised land because he knows that it's going to be difficult to live godly lives in an evil country. And then when you get in chapter 32 and you get into this verse of the song that Moses is teaching them to sing, he gets into verse 11, and this is what he says. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. Yes, I'm in the Bible. Bearing them on its pinions. The, the, your name is written in the book. Of, okay. And, and the Lord alone guided him. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. He's like, what a strange verse. Why do, what Moses is doing, he's comparing how God has been training the Israelite nation the way an eaglet trains its young. I mean, the eagle trains its young, the eaglet. See, to the eaglet, the nest, you see, it says the eagle stirs up its nest. The nest is a safe place, the nest is security. The nest is a comfortable place. This is their world as a baby. When they hatch, as, as their egg, this is their world. When they hatch, they stay in this nest. This is their world. This is all they know, and this is all they care to know. Because all the food they're ever going to eat is in the nest. All the family they're going to ever know is in the nest. All, all the peace that they ever experience is in the nest. Everything, all their needs are met in the nest. This is all they know, this nest. And yet the day comes that the mother eagle or the father eagle, the adult eagle, the parent eagle, stirs the nest. And what that means, it destroys the nest. It tears it up, breaks it apart, so that now the eaglet has to work its way out to the edge because it's now not comfortable. It's an uncomfortable place. It, doesn't want, it, it can't stay in here. It wants to stay, but the eagle, the parent eagle knows it can't stay because this little eaglet, is, they, they know that it was born to fly. You can't stay here in the nest. You were born to fly. You were born to, you were destined to explore, to go beyond the nest. You can't stay in the nest because if they stay in the nest, the nest becomes a prison. If they stay in the nest, the nest becomes a coffin. So the eagle stirs up the nest. It flutters. It says, the scripture says, it flutters over the nest. That means it's saying, get out, get out, get out, get out. It's taking its wings and it's saying, get out, get out. And the eaglet is nudged off the edge of the nest, nudged out, and is falling. If it went up at the top of a tree or top of a cliff, it's out to do what it's designed to do, fly, to soar, to go beyond the limitations of the nest. I mean, this is for their own good. This has to be done. And the little eagle doesn't always fly good right away. They usually tumble for a while. And if you've ever seen a little bird try to fly the first time, the wings are going crazy, but they're not, they're not gaining any altitude. They're still going down. That's why the scripture says that the eagle will spread its wings and it'll swoop down and it will catch the eaglet on its pinions. 
on those feathers of the wings. Not with his talons and not with his beak, but on the feathers. So it can return them back up to the edge of the nest to knock them off again. Really, that's what they do. I mean, this is what they do. And it's, it's so they can, but the eagle always stays close. Never wanders far off. Always returns to catch it and take it back. Always there to guide it back to the nest to go again and to go again and try again and gain some confidence and gain some, gain some strength. And before it knows, it's become an eagle. And it can soar. For Christians, put myself in there too for the Christian the church is our nest this is our nest we feel safe here we feel comfort here on the cold days we feel warm in here on the hot days we feel cool in here it's cozy in here we feel secure in here we gather here for support we gather here for encouragement we gather here for protection our spiritual needs are met in the nest and given a choice we choose to stay in the nest because I like the nest. I like coming in here every week. I like, I like coming in here every Sunday and gather with other believers. I enjoy coming here and getting my spiritual reboot, you know. It's been a rough week. I like coming on Sunday morning and get that little charge. I like to come into the nest and get what I need. I like, I like to get my praise on on a Sunday morning. I like to be around other people that like to sing. I like, I like those moments when I get the goosebumps in the middle of a certain song. Or I like the, the moments when, when, when the scriptures tug at my heart and it causes me, cause me to cry. I like when Ronnie messes up and it causes me to laugh. I just like being in the nest and, and you know, praying together and singing together and serving one another. And I like the nest. I don't want to get out of the nest. I want to stay right here in the nest. But according to Deuteronomy, it said, Moses says that God stirs his nest. He stirs his nest. And maybe you're like me. When I read that, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I remember, remember I've, I've read in the scriptures where God really wants to bring us together like a mother hen wants to gather its chicks and under its wings so he can protect us and love us and comfort us. I've read that. That's what God was. But why, why, does God want, why does God want to force me out of the nest? Why does God want to stir up everything and force me out of my comfort zone? Why does he want to do that? So that we can become who we were designed to be. He knows what we can do. But what, I've, what I've come to realize in my life and, and, and being in the pastor and being in ministry and stuff and watching is that, that it is, most of us have enough God to make us comfortable. You know, we've consumed just enough God to, to, to feel safe and secure. We know just enough about God to feel safe and secure, comfortable. We're, 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 we're comfortable with where we are in our relationship with God. We're, we know just enough, or we feel we know just enough, God, to feel right at home at church. You know, to come in and sit beside other believers. To come in and worship with other believers. To come in and care for other believers and serve other believers. And being taught by the scriptures and being fed by the songs. Enjoying the nest. We have as much of God as we want in the nest, but not enough God to make us uncomfortable. Not enough God to allow him to push us out of the nest, out of our comfort zone, into this world around us, a world that's surrounded by darkness and hopelessness, a world that needs what we have in the nest. They need it out there. See, we're not called to sit in the nest. God never called any of us to sit in the nest. He called us to fly on wings like eagles, to explore what he has planned for us in our lives as individuals and as a church. And I know I've said this before. I said it last year. I probably said it the year before, and I'll probably say it again, but we know it's true. We're not called to be consumers. We're not called at all to be consumers, but we're called to be contributors. We're called to be contributors. So, you see, for most Christians, church is their nest. This is, this, is, they, this is where they come. This is where they show up one to two hours a week to be fed, to 
consumed to find out what's in the nest. What's in the nest for me? What can I find in the nest, in, in the nest for me? Does, is the nest going to meet my needs today? Because it always has. Is it going to meet my needs today? The, 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 the church is a nest, and, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not who they are. It's, 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 their, it's still their nest, but it's not who they are. The, the church is supposed to be, is supposed to have an idea of how can I serve someone today? How can I meet someone else's needs? How can I help someone? How can I show compassion to someone? How can I show the love of Jesus to someone? How can I, how can I participate? How can I, how can I make a difference in the kingdom? How can I make a difference in the kingdom? Am I making a difference in the kingdom sitting in this nest? We're not the church if we stay in the nest. We want to be the church, what God has designed us to be. We're not churches. See, God can do so much more for us and through us if we just get out of the nest. Go beyond, step off the ledge. What, what does it look like, right? What does it look like to have our, uh, the, for the, this nest to be stirred in, in our lives here? What, what does it look like to fly on wings like eagles? What does it look like to trust God's call on my life, to do what he's designed me to do? How does that work in my life? I mean, I, I read it in the, New Te- in the Old Testament, and, and, but how does it work today? And I think the best way I can show you and, and help, help us all understand what it's like to be stirred out of the nest is to look at an example where Jesus stirred the nest of his disciples. See, what is in the Old Testament, it shows up in the New Testament. The disciples have been walking with Jesus for quite a while. They've been listening to him. They've been watching him for quite a while. And Jesus, it's time to, it's time to test their wings. You know, it's time to stir the nest. And I'm sure like most Christians, they would have rather just stayed right there with Jesus. It's comfortable here. It's safe right here with Jesus. Why don't we just sit here with Jesus and consume more of his teachings? Why don't we consume more of his miracles and consume consume more of who he is by his healings? Why don't we just stay right here? This will be best for us. Us 12 to stay right here. But in Matthew chapter 10, it says this in verse 5. It says, these 12, this is his disciples here, these 12 Jesus sent out. He stirs the nest. He just comes on him and says, he doesn't say next week we're going to do this or next month. He just comes up to him and he sends them out. He stirs the nest with the following instructions. So he's fluttering over them. Get out, but I'm right here. Let me tell you what I want you to do and how this is going to work. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter, enter the towns of the Samaritans. Don't, don't, don't go there. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus didn't say, let's wait on them to come here. Let's wait on them to come to our nest, to get comfortable in our nest, to get acclimated to our nest. He didn't say that. He said, go to the lost. That's the first thing he told them to do. The first thing, when he stirred the nest, they pushed him out, and he tells us, go to the lost. And this go requires leaving the nest. It requires getting out of the nest. It requires being uncomfortable. But I like it here. It's comfortable. No, 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 no. I want you to go. But Jesus, we like being around you. We like to walk on the water with you. We like to make it through the storms. No, 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 no. Go. Get out of the nest. You have to leave. It requires, it's not going to be comfortable. It's going to require more than just an hour of our time each week. Go requires us to live a godly life every day outside the nest. Go, but don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the ones you know. Oh, what? Why would I go to the ones I know? You, well, go to your friends at school. The people you meet when you arrive at school, the people you meet before the bell rings, the people you meet between class, the people you meet in the cafeteria, the people you hang around with after extracurricular, band, sports, whatever. Go, go to your friends at school. Go to the people you work with. Sit in an office with have coffee with, share lunch with. Go to your family, go to your friends, the people that you know. Go to the ones you know. Why? Why do I go to them? Why can't I go to the Gentiles? Why can't I go to the Samaritans? Because this is a test flight. You're just now getting out of the nest. You're not going to be able to soar to the mountaintop over there. You're going to fall for a little while. 
You just need to go, you, you need to go and get your bearings. What I want you to do is I want you to understand what I've given you. I want you to understand what I've been teaching you. I want you to experience what I've shared with you. I, I, I want you to I want you to tell tell people what I've taught you. But you know, don't go to people that go to somebody that you know that'll take some time to listen to you. Go to those people that you know. Because when we because when I want you to fly. But you can't fly right now. It's going to be terrifying for you because you've been around me. Now I'm going to be out there by yourself. But go to somebody you know that, that'll be gentle with you, really. That it won't chew you up and spit you out. When we go to the loss, we're contributing to, we're adding to the kingdom, the mission of the kingdom. When we go to the lost, the people that we know, we're being the church because we show them that we care about them. We tell them, this is what Jesus has done in my life. This is what Jesus is doing in my life. Where do you go to church? I want to invite you to my church, but I want to tell you what it's going to be about before you get there. It's, just, it's, it's going to be different. It's different because Jesus has made a different in our, difference in our lives. and we, we share that with them. Jesus says, but I want you to get out of the nest. I want you to go. I want you to go to the people you know, but this is what I want you to do. When you go, in verse 7, he says, as you go, proclaim this message, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is what I want you to tell them. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And what he's telling his disciples and what he's telling us, go to the lost. And second, I want you to show them heaven. Show them heaven. He goes on and says, I want you to heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. He's telling his disciples, what you've seen done, do. What you've been taught, tell. What you've been given, give. And what you've been shown, show. Tell these people, show them heaven. And then he goes on and says, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff for the worker is worth his keep. You don't need anything else. Just trust God for everything. Don't pack a lot of stuff. You don't need to go to college and study all these theological stuff. You don't need to have seminary to, to, to go to the lost. Just go. Trust me on this. I put flutter, flutter, flutter. Get out of the nest. Get out of the nest. Go to some people that you know, some people that you recognize that recognize you, and just show them heaven. Just show them what it looks like. Take all the power that you've been given in the nest and take it out there. You know what it feels like when we come together and we, all right, last Sunday when we had to call off services and we had the, the groups to meet out here in the lobby and we prayed. You know what that felt like? Remember what that felt like to pray together? You know what it feels like when we really get in here worshiping together and the song is just right and the, the spirit is just right and we're worshiping together, when we're praying together, when we worship together, when we start serving in the community together and we start caring for one another here in the nest. You know what that feels like? You know how we get charged up and energized? Then operate with that same power out there. It's the same thing. Take it out there. Pray for them. Pray with them. I know it's awkward at times, but sometimes it's, it's uncomfortable. At times. I know I've been there. Last week, I, I guess it was because we didn't have power. I get this great illustration, and God just placed it. In, my mother passed away last year, and she had you know, two vehicles. And if you, anybody familiar with going to the DMV on Car Street? Y'all have a good time out there, right? It's wonderful, isn't it? Let me, let me tell you something. The people I've met out there, the three times that I've had to go out there, they're a blessing. Because I've been, I've been able to talk to just about every one of them. So anyway, I'm, actually, I'm back out there Monday because I did something wrong at the courthouse. And I have to go to the, back to the DMV to get this information. I don't know what I'm asking for, but they said they'll know. So, and I'm just terrified when you go in those places. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, they make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about. And, but I had this lady down toward the end. And one lady at the very end, all she's handling is tags. You take a tag, hand it to her, and, and that's all. You, you can't go talk to her. So... I get called to the lady right beside her, but right before I'm called to the lady right beside her, she leaves. And you know, when somebody leaves and the line basically stops. 
until someone else comes back and says, help next person. Well, then I'm up there. And this lady's not there, but I'm talking to this lady, and I tell her what I need, and she's getting me this information, and she's taking care of it. My brother's standing right here just in case he has to sign anything because you don't want to mess up at the DMV. And so we're standing there. They're, very, they're, they're, they're beautiful people, and they're very helpful. Well, then this lady comes back, and when she comes back, she's crying. And I'm like, oh, well. So she calls the lady up there, and the lady that I'm talking to says, are you okay? And she says, no. I'm like, you know, tears. And I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm just, I just need to fill my stuff out so I can leave because I don't want to stay here in the DMV. Wasn't there a fire the first of the week down at Carolina Beach? Condos burn up? This lady in the station beside of me, she turns and says, I just got to call my best friend died in that fire. And she says, do you need to leave? And she says, no, I got to help this lady. So she's struggling, she's crying, and she's dealing with this. And I'm like, hmm. This lady's taking care of me, but nobody's taking care of her. I'm in the DMV. I'm not in the lobby and I'm not in church. I'm in the DMV. Here's your papers and stuff. She's, she's still crying over here. And she's trying to work on a computer. And you know how people can be, you need to hurry up. I got, and I'm like, her heart's broke. My brother's standing here and I'm like, all right, I got this. This is what you need. This is what you need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, he takes off out the aisle and I just, I slide over beside the lady that's waiting on her tag information. And I'm thinking, this is really rude. And this is really out of place. And I'm very uncomfortable standing here beside this lady. African-American lady standing right here. I'm, I'm really, because you know, it's, it's DMV. And so the lady's looking at her computer screen and she finally turns and she catches me. And so I'm, I said, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. I don't mean to bother you. And I said, I said, but can I pray for you? And she just looked at me and she said, please. So I reach across the counter, which you're not supposed to do. I reach across the counter and she takes my hands. And I said, what was your friend's name? Sheila. Okay. What's your name? Lauren. All right. So I start praying for Lauren because of Sheila and Sheila's family. She just died this morning. She couldn't get out. So we're praying. Now I happen to notice in my ear, nobody else is working. Nobody else is talking. There's no arguments. There's nothing going on. Nobody's clicking computers or nothing. Everybody stopped. And the lady beside me, she reaches up and grabs my hands. <laughs> Show them heaven. Get out of the nest. You know how it feels in here. Take that out there. Let them, you know, take our circum go, go into their circumstances and show them heaven. Contribute to their understanding of heaven. See, their understanding of heaven is this way off. I won't see anything about heaven until Sunday morning. So heaven doesn't happen on a Monday. Heaven doesn't happen on a Wednesday. Heaven is way out there in the universe somewhere. That's their understanding. Contribute to their understanding and tell them heaven has come near. Show them heaven. Let them see what a life, a life in, in Christ looks like. Show them heaven. And then he goes on. He says, now, whatever town, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay in their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. Go to the lost. Show them heaven and produce peace. Produce peace. Jesus says when you enter a house, let your peace rest on it. Not mine, yours. You should have a spirit of peace about you. When we, when we, everything we do outside the nest revolves around the peace of Christ in our life. A peace that passes all understanding is what the scripture says. See, you're going, we're going to find it impossible to fly. We're going to find it impossible to soar like eagles if we have a spirit of drama and conflict. Because we have a spirit of drama and conflict, nobody wants to be around us. You know those people. You don't want to be around them either. They don't want to be around us. And Jesus says, don't take that with us. And for us to be able to go to the lost and for us to be able to show them heaven, we have to speak and act and live with the mind of Christ, with the heart of Christ, and with the peace of Christ. And if, if there was ever anything that this society needs right now, it's a Christian who can produce peace. Amen. 
in someone's life. You know, so we can do this. So, so he says, produce peace. Go to the lost. Show them heaven. Produce peace. Now, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Well, I can do that. If they don't like me, I can leave. Oh, what he's telling his disciples is, you need to expect rejection and get over it. That's what he's telling them. Go to the law, show them heaven, produce peace, and expect rejection and get over it. See, the parent eagle knows that the little eaglet will not be able to soar like them. They know that's not going to happen. That's why they stay there, especially on the first of two. That's why they're there to catch them. That's why they're there to protect them and to guide them back up to the edge to try it again. See, not everyone's going to listen to us. Sometimes we're a peculiar people. The scriptures even call us peculiar people because we believe in a God that no one can see, that gave his son for us, and no one believes that that happened. But it changed our lives that way unless we go to them and tell them and show it to them and produce peace. Not everyone's going to listen. But it shouldn't stop us from trying to fly. For being who we were made to be. So we shake the dust off means that we move on. Shaking the dust off means try it again. And each time, each time we try, you know we gain a little more confidence. We, we step a little further. We soar a little higher. The eaglet, each time, would fly and fly a little further, a little further till it gets to the place where it can soar high. Knowing that the parent eagle was always there, we know that God is always there. Even if we fail, try. All right, next time I try, I'm going to try just a little bit harder. I'm going to try a little bit longer. I'm going to approach a little more compassion. I'm going to pray at the DMV in front of people I don't know. I'm going to break a rule. But I'm going to produce peace. I'm going to show them heaven. But I don't know if I can do that. I, I really don't know if I can do that, Ronnie. You, you did that because you're a pastor. No, I, I bleed like y'all bleed. I worry like y'all worry. I read the same things y'all read. I, the Bible is... Let me tell you that you can. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who trust in the Lord, those who step out of the nest, those who are nudged off the edge of it just to go and try to fly, will find new strength. I like that. It doesn't say they'll find strength. They'll find new strength. And what that means is they'll discover something that they already had. They just didn't know it was there. The eaglet never knew it could fly, but it was born to fly. And each time, they realized it could fly. So those who trust in the Lord, those who are willing to take a step, a step of faith, a leap of faith to soar, they will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. It doesn't say that they'll soar high on wings of eagles. Those are the eaglets. They're on their mom and daddy's wings till they get confidence. This doesn't say that. This says that we will fly, we will soar high on wings like eagles because we'll find it, we'll discover this new strength that God has given us. It's always been there all along. Once Jesus has entered our life, He has given us every talent, every ability, and every strength that we need to soar. We just don't know it's there. It's the same as our faith. We have all the faith that we will ever need inside of us because of Jesus. We just don't know it's there because we don't try it out. We have just enough, God, to feel safe in the nest, but not enough to make us feel uncomfortable. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. We are the church. And we are the church, but not in the nest. We exist for out there. We exist for the world. And being the church out there is God's plan for us. Well, let me ask you this question. Was, was Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, was that enough for me to step out of the nest? Was his sacrifice on the cross enough 
or do I need to God or do I need God to do something else for me in the nest? So I'll step out. I've always heard people say, if God would just do this, if God would use this, just some kind of miracle, if God would use this, just some, something incredible, and I'm like, <laughs> what, what else could he do? He's given us everything we need right here in the nest. Now it's time to get out. He stirs his nest, flutters his wings, says, go. Go to the law. Show them heaven. Live a godly life. You ought to do that. Do some peace. Not everybody's going to like it. But I'm right here. Let's try again. Let's be the church. Let's pray. God, we're challenged when we read your word. We're, we're challenged in the Old Testament. We're challenged in the New Testament. And, when, and then we, when we, we see it come alive in our life. When it becomes part of our every day, God, it's just, it's, oh, it's just overwhelming that you do this and you do it on a regular basis maybe we're too far down in the nest and we don't see it because you created us to do so much I can look back last year there were several times we stepped out of the edge of the nest and we, we flew a little bit everything didn't always work we tried again and we, we tried this Oh, that, didn't, that didn't quite carry us very far, but a little stronger, a little more determined, a little more committed, a little more confidence. Now it's 2018. Do I stay here in the nest? Because it's been pretty comfortable. It's been a great 2017. Do I, do I hang on to that? Then when I open your Bible and I start reading, it says, stirs the nest. And all I see now is twigs flying here and comfort going there. And I got to try something here. I, I'm off the edge now. I feel like I'm falling. I feel like I have no control over my life. But yet, there's an assurance, there's a calm, there's a peace that you're always here with me to help me, to give me strength, to give me courage to try it again. I went a little farther this week, God. I went just a little further. I prayed with people in church. I prayed with people at funeral homes and for meals and stuff. I've never prayed for anybody in the DMV. I got to go back one more time. I hope she's there so I can see if I've produced any peace in her life. See, God, that's how I want to live my life every day. I want to live my, on, on, the, on the edge, right on the edge, to step off, to experience your presence in a unique way, to experience your love in a powerful way, to be who you designed me to be. Yes, Jesus' sacrifice was enough. It was enough. I'll remember that every day. And I'll cling to that. And it'll help me soar even further. God, we praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.